Okay, a very big welcome to Denby Dale Amateur Radio Club and delighted to uh, see club members and visitors uh, again tonight. And I'm really pleased to welcome back for the last part of their three part, not that we don't want to see you again, but uh, the last part of your three part presentation on HF to see Anthony and Dennis. What I need to say to both of you before you kick off is that uh, a lot of people in the last uh, couple of weeks have commented that uh, they have um, got a lot from your presentation. And some of those people are by no means beginners in amateur radio. That I think everyone has made a comment to me that we found something we didn't know about before the meeting and something we're going to go off and explore. So that's, that, that, is, that is really great. And um, uh, a lot of people have been looking forward to, to you bringing it all together as you indicated your part three is going to be tonight so uh without uh waffling away i'm going to hand the microphone over who's going to kick off is that you anthony or dennis i'm going to kick off so uh give me a thumbs up if you're seeing our slideshow very good well good evening everyone i'm anthony lusky kilo weight zulu tango and i'm dennis kidder w6dq this is my contact information and i have a website kzt.com and I don't, but I've got the uh, the email there. You can always reach me at collinsuser at yahoo.com or my call sign at arrl.net, w60q at arrl.net. And I'm well, I welcome emails. The slideshow tonight has a number of links embedded in it, and you can get to all those links. This is actually the slideshow for all three episodes at tiny.cc slash uk bghf uk beginners hf and uh dennis and i have been having a lot of fun trying to translate things into uk sp speak as opposed to us speak and uh we've we've learned a lot too so this has been a real learning episode for us also so tonight we're going to talk about setting up your radio hf challenges computers in the shack and a what else section. And Dennis and I will be doing tandem bouncing back and forth as we go along here. So tag team presentation. <laughs> and we're gonna start with Dennis. Okay. I was gonna say, Anthony, I do understand some of the terminology because I have spent time, I spent time in uh, both Australia and in Hong Kong. I lived in Hong Kong for four and a half years. So I, I've got some of the, uh, I've got some of the, um, the funny, the, the the differences between our, our two countries separated by a common language, which I always love. Okay. Now, I, I also spend time in Scotland, so I've gotten completely confused. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about all the equipment and everything through the last uh, two weeks. And today we're going to talk about putting it all together and, and building your radio shack. So where do you put your radio shack? And we start off by saying, you know, shack is a term of endearment. And that came from the uh, maritime as a matter of fact, that ships added a radio station, they would basically just build a shack on deck and that became the radio shack. So that's where that, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, we got somebody unmuted. Uh, okay, that's it. Okay, um, uh, so that's where that term came from. And it refers to where your radio and your other equipment that's related to your radio, it, it, it uh, describes where that's all located. It can be in the house, it can be in a garage, it can be in a shed. As I have here, it's in a, a actually an old, actually two old mobile homes that we've uh, converted into a radio shack. So uh, any number of things that you can do. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Anthony. So space is limited. You have a lot of options. I mean, in closing and in closed storage, you can make it safe and secure. So like uh, Anthony shows a, a roll top desk here, which would look like any piece of furniture in your house, in your home. And uh, the other photo is in the middle is my friend, my friend K5PZ, who's a silent key now, unfortunately, but a good friend. And he had a Collins S line installed in a console. So it looked like a piece of furniture that you could have in your in your living room, for instance, and uh, nobody would object to it. And of course, you can mount everything in a rack. And I, of course, I've got multiple rackfuls of equipment here <laughs> that I use. But anyway, um, if space is limited, there's always options. Closets work really well. So 
So you want to, there are some considerations that you have to take uh, where you're going to put your shack. Noise and privacy is important, and, and not just for you, but for your family members and folks around you. Uh, they probably don't want to listen to you uh, banging out CW at three o'clock in the morning, you know, but uh, uh, those are things to think about. Power, of course, is important. Getting uh, sufficient main service to the area that you're located, not such a big deal with a small uh, low power station like a 100 watt station. But if you start adding an amplifier, uh, you may, well, so your yes. your mains are already 220, <laughs> but uh, that would work fine probably for an amplifier, kilowatt amplifier, but you may have to have a higher higher service brought in for that. Uh, you need a desk or a countertop and and desk can be as simple as an old door sitting on a couple of two drawer file cabinets. And I've done that in the past and that works really great as a, as a uh, operating desk. Um, safety is an important consideration, especially around uh, the RF. Uh, you want to be isolated from children, pets, infants, especially because they like to crawl around and get into things. If you've got a lot of cables on the floor from your radios, that can be a problem. So you want to keep uh, keep your pets away from that and keep your kids away from that. You also have to have access to uh, outdoors for your antenna, your, your basically your lead-ins from the antenna, as well as the ability to earth your system. So earthing is important. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And of course, comfort is, in my mind, that's one of the number one things, having a having a nice uh, warm room in the wintertime. Uh, and I got to tell you, I just got my heater working yesterday here in the shack. I've been uh, freezing out here in uh, near freezing, freezing temperatures outdoors overnight. And the temperatures in the ham shack have been a little unbearable, but I now have heat and it's very comfortable. I'm finally in my shirt sleeves. But uh, humidity and dampness, of course, uh, you want to avoid that. That's bad for electrical equipment. Comfortable chair. I, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're going to spend a lot of time on the air, a comfy chair is, uh, is quite important and uh, is a good investment. As much as an invest, a good investment is buying a radio and putting up good antennas. Um, you might want to have a separate area for a workshop. Uh, I have a separate room here in my radio shack that's my uh, workshop area, and I've got storage, you know, parts storage and things like that. Do that for repairs and for kit building, especially. You want to have a place to be able to do that. You need wall space. And, of course, this place has got so many windows in it, I've got a real shortage of wall space. But you want to have a place to put up things like a UTC clock, your maps and your charts. And you probably want to display QSL cards and awards as well. Uh, you need a location for storage and you want to be able to have all your accessories, your supplies, books, especially at close at hand. And for computer, you need to have Internet access close at hand as well. So those are remi all reminder yeah, to everyone, whenever you see this type of font, that means there's oh, yes. a link you can click on for further information. Yeah, that's right. Forgot about that, Anthony. Thank you. Your turn. So if your space is limited, you might want to consider a rapid deployment type go box. That's rapid deployment means simply you flip down the lid or open something up and you're ready to operate. You don't need to set anything up. And actually on the far right here is uh, an example of the case that I had when I was first licensed. Uh, originally, this had actually an Argonaut 515 in it. This is a uh, another version of it, but this is the same box my father and I built. Uh, when I was 26 years old. So this has been around for about 43 years. I could simply put this in the closet. When I was ready to operate, I took it out and put it on the table in the apartment and I was able to operate. All I had to do was connect the antenna and plug in the power and everything else was interconnected in the back of this. Uh, just to the left of that is my current uh, rapid deployment go box with a KX3 in it. Here's another iteration I had in the past with that with a I'm sorry, with a uh, Yesu FT817. And this is a, a commercial box that they're using here that's quite uh, often used for audio purposes. Mm -hmm. It has a lid that fits over the front of it. Uh, one of the things you have to be careful of when you start building this type of box is it really becomes difficult to move around because of weight. So just be aware that maybe you don't want all your radios and all your stuff in one box because it might get a little too bit heavy. Two boxes is sometimes easier to move around. Uh, items that require frequent, uh, let's talk about Radio Shack ergonomics, items that, with frequent interaction, your rig, your rotor control, your key or paddle, et cetera, et cetera, should be at the main level within easy reach. I see people all the time where they have the radio up high, and I don't know how they do that, because when I reach up all the time, it really starts to affect my wrist and my elbow. So I always have my radio so I can put my 
wrist on the table and reach up and tune that. I put the other things up higher that I'm not act interacting with as often, power supplies, amplifiers. They can be off to the off away from the main level or off to the sides. Elbow or wrist on the table when tuning the radio. Radio to the left or right, depending on the operator's uh, handedness. So I, my, radio, my main radio is on the right. I have a backup radio on the left. Uh, sight lines for computer and radio for easy and comfortable viewing. And as you'll see in the picture of my shack coming up, my computer is actually directly in front of me. My radio is slightly off to the side. And now we have both of our shacks. And I'm going to let Dennis talk first, and then I'll come back in. So this is a portion. My, I, first of all, I have to tell you that my shack is my complete shack, other than my repair area downstairs. But Dennis's shack is one corner of about maybe eight times this much equipment. <laughs> yeah, that's Twelve one, times. <laughs> yeah, that's one little tiny corner of the, of my shack. That's true. I, I have um, a total of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six rooms in the shack, which is, like I said, was two 60 foot mobile homes that we repurposed. And that happens to be where I run my AM station. And there, there's a, a old, uh, old broadcast transmitters I've repurposed for amateur and I've got an old Collins mixing console. But that's just one one location out of my shack. And I'm quite proud of that that set up there. You can see part another part of my shack behind me. This is another room. This is my main operating desk behind me where I, I spend most of my time. And of course, I'm sitting at another operating desk. I've got a Collins S line sitting in front of me here. I want to add one thing, Anthony, that, that if you look at the desk behind me, I don't know if you can see it, if the camera's down far enough. One of the things that I've learned over the years is it's nice. I, I, I don't like the radios up high, like Anthony said, but I've elevated them a couple of inches so I have space under the radio where I can stick things like paper tablet of paper my uh my uh, keyboard for my computer my mouse can go under there uh, other items that i use frequently but i don't want them cluttering the desk so it's a way to get them out of the way so i always i've always had a that's something i learned when i was a novice believe it or not over 50 years ago is to, to build a little riser to get it maybe a couple of inches off the desktop you can still easily reach the um reach the radios but you also have that extra storage space that I really like. So that's yeah. just my opinion, but but I want to well, share that. Mine really aren't at the desk level because I have the bells down. So they're actually about two to three inches above the area there. So there is a little bit of space and you can actually see, I cleaned everything up here, but this radio on the left always has stuff sliding underneath it. Right now there's a microphone stuck under the corner of it. But um, this is my shack and you can notice the computer in the, in the middle here. Um, you really can't, this is my key, you really can't see my key in here because I, for some reason it got moved off to the side when I took this picture. But my main radio is slightly to my right. This is an Elecraft K, K3S and my antenna switches are up here. My power supplies are actually under the cam, counter. I have little wire baskets that hold them under the countertop and they're completely under there and out of the way so you don't even see the power supplies. Here's my rotor control and it's right when I reach my left hand out, my rotor control is right there. Uh, so I can do that, my, um, some of my backup radios. And I added a third monitor a few years ago by ch buying a cheap uh, HDMI TV. And I don't use this for text as much as right now, if I glance up there, I actually have our slide list uh, with our different numbers when Dennis and I switch back and forth. A lot of times I'll have maps up here during contest, so I can put multipliers up here during contest and out of the way. But uh, that's, mm. then I also have maps on the wall, QSL cards, of course. And then I have a blimp because I am about 10 miles away from Akron where uh, the Goodyear blimp was first built. So I, of course, have to have a blimp in my shack. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> All right. So this this slide we have to do some talking about this slide because as you see it says nec that's the national electric code here in the united states well we're not going to talk about the national electric code very much but they're very similar to british standard 7671 which hopefully you are familiar with um that talks about uh, uh electrical safety and proper installations and things like that so we'll talk about uh, all of that um 
so once you've installed your antenna, you've got your radios all set up. Now you've got to route that cable from the antenna, your coax or whatever feed line you're using to the transceiver and hook up the power supply and all of that. So our national electric code states, and this is this I this is the verbiage directly out of our national electric code that each conductor of a lead in from an outdoor antenna is provided with a listed antenna discharge unit, basically a lightning, a lightning arrestor type device, which I think you 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 refer to as surge protection devices, SPDs in the UK. So that's unfortunately, I've been trying to get a copy of 7671. I had a copy of it years ago when I was working in Hong Kong because of the project I was working on. I don't have access to it anymore. So I couldn't get the exact verbiage for it, unfortunately. So you'll have to you'll have to bear with me, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's some we have some uh, references that you can use. Uh, so these uh, surge protection devices, these are typical um gas discharge devices that are used to protect your antennas well not the antenna but more really the radios from static discharges from lightning strikes nearby and things like that you don't have to have a direct strike from a lightning strike to damage equipment if it's within a a, a certain radius of even a half a mile um, it can induce <clears throat> induce enough current flow into the antenna that it can produce some pretty high voltages in your equipment and cause damage. One of the things that I use on, uh, I use separate receive antennas. And so I have uh, receiver inputs. I use a, a little gadget here. If you could see that in my my picture there, this is actually a, a uh, uh, they call it a front end protector. It's really, you can't transmit through this, but it's extra protection for the input of a, for a receiver input. You wouldn't put this on a transceiver unless it has a separate receiver antenna input, which many of my radios do. So this is what I use on my system to protect the receiver because that's really what's most sensitive. So the idea is that 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 uh, antenna discharge unit, the surge protector, is located exterior to your to your home, and it's grounded, earthed. You have an earthing rod nearby as well as if you see in this image you run a very heavy cable to your this would be your main service entrance here and there's going to be a ground or an earthing rod by the service entrance your mains and you're going to tie these two things together and this is called a common uh, uh, it's basically a single point what you'd call a single point earth we would call it a single point ground these two things are tied together so you don't create in a, in a static discharge, you don't create a potential difference between here and here because of ground resistance, and that can be a real problem. So that's what that's the requirement here, and I, I expect that the requirement in, in Britain is exactly the same, probably worded a little different, but it's going to be a similar, if not the same, requirement. And this is typical installation where um, you see in this photograph, you see the, um, the there's a ground rod here, an earthing rod here, yeah, we're looking down. That's real. You're looking real down, you right? See. You're looking down at the ground, and I I have one problem with this photograph, and I'll explain that in a minute. But but this is typically your uh, your SPD, the surge protection device, right here, tied to a ground rod or an earthing rod, and then what you see here are two cables. Those are the cables that tie this grounding earthing rod back to the mains power entrance. So this is a very common setup. The problem I see with this photograph, and I think I've commented about this before, is this looks like it's a foundation for a, for structure. It might be the, a concrete foundation for a building. Um, at the bottom, a ground rod should not be that close. An earthing rod should not be that close to a foundation. It should be at least half its length away from that foundation. So if that's an eight, at, let's say a two meter ground rod, it should be at least a meter away from the building to be properly installed. So just a comment about that, but and these yeah, are the, these are where the wires are coming in from the yeah common... yeah I'm sorry I was sitting here with my mouse I'm going wait a minute you're not seeing that thanks yeah. Anthony yes <laughs> you won't see my mouse <laughs> so part of this um, part of bringing all this into your home you've come through those surge suppressors now you have a way you have a, a a common ground this is another common ground they're using a copper sheet to form a plate that you can put all your feed throughs for your antennas on that plate and then ground that plate to that same single point earth or single point ground. And you can do that at your antenna feed throughs here, as you can see. And at the bottom on the left-hand side, you'll see a copper strap. 
that copper strap is going back to that earthing post, wherever it might be. The, the right-hand picture shows something that you might install on your operating desk or something like that. Um, that's a commercial uh, ground, uh, ground bus. And those work very well, but there's a lot of other ways you can do that. You can use copper pipe, for instance. I've used copper pipe on the back of my desk with having that tied back to my earth, uh, earth uh, post, and then we'll run a short wire from the radio to that piece of copper tubing or copper pipe and use like a what we call a stainless steel hose clamp to clamp the wire to that uh, copper tubing. And that's another effective way to do it. So there's lots of ways, lots of ways. Um, so there's two things we need to talk about. There's electrical safety and RF. So electrical safety, that's, that's really brought to you by all your local regulations, which would be part of the British standard, the 7671, plus any, any local authority that may have some other requirements for uh, local electrical safety. And the idea is to protect you from electrocution from, from your equipment. And of course, to protect your equipment from, um, from miswire, miswired uh, circuitry and things like that. So that's that's your electrical safety. RF safety has to do with preventing interference. And, and we say here stray RF in the shack, uh, which can become a big problem if you're running high power. And so the idea, it's not the same as electrical safety. It's a little different. And the distance between the equipment and that earthing post are really important because if that happens to be a multiple of a quarter wavelength, of a frequency that are odd multiple of a quarter wavelength of a frequency that you're operating on that ground earthing cable will disappear it'll become a high impedance so you're not grounded to rf so that's one of the things that uh, we have to consider um uh, um, uh ward silver and zero ax has a great book that's published by the arrl and there's a video that goes along with that anthony's added some links here and um, I'm not sure who wrote this, but this is an addendum to Ward's book on grounding from a UK standpoint. So you, there's a link there where you can pull this up uh, and and have a lot of information that talks about the uh, the codes and things like that. Yeah, G6 GPF, that John Woodhouse, he is the one that uh, that did that, and I I love that that I love that quote. Uh, <laughs> I heard that the first time when I lived in Hong Kong from some of my British friends there that I was working with. That was wonderful. <laughs> but anyway, um, let's see. I think uh, okay. you got one more slide. One more slide. Steve Katz is a well-known ham here in the United States, WB2WIK. We've been trying to get a hold of him without much luck, but he has some very, uh, very good opinions and good ideas about about grounding, earthing. And I, I urge you to look at some of the things that he has written. And Anthony's got a link there to some of his, uh, some of his publications. And uh, boy, he, he knows his stuff. So he's a, he's a good reference. Between Ward Silver and Steve Katz, you can't go wrong. They've got some great information for you. So let's see. I think this is one I'm still doing. This is yeah, you get to do this, this last one. Yeah, I'll I'll do this one. This is actually a repeat. We're going to start talking about antennas, and Anthony's going to go into a lot more detail about this. But <clears throat> this is a repeat of a slide I think we did last time in uh, week two, and it basically describes the various types of antennas and and pros and cons. So depending on what your situation is, where you live, how much real estate you have, if you have a lot of property. You, you have a little different situation than if you're living in a flat in the city. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of good information on that link. Please do check that out. So that's why we want to do a, uh, a refresh on that just to remind folks of it. So there you go. Thanks, Anthony. Over to you. OK, and, you know, I'm going to drag this one another slide in temporarily here before I get started. People always ask me, well, what do you have at your house antenna-wise? So I just have a little diagram here showing what I'm actually doing antenna-wise at my location. I am lucky enough to have a 50-foot tower. I also have a 43-foot uh, vertical in the tree. You can't see it because of the trees. But for my the low bands, I'm using an 80-meter soper and a 160 soper. This, 60, this 160 soper has a small loading coil in it, so it also is effective on 40 and 160, but it's only about 20 meters long 
and it goes down to the ground level almost here. And with my five watts, I've actually worked all states on 160 and 86 countries with that particular That's cool. piece of wire. So when we talk yeah. about limitations, we so, won't talk what, about we won't talk about my antenna installations here, Anthony, because we don't have enough time. <laughs> I know we don't have enough room either to get it all on the screen. <laughs> you need to use the uh, satellite view pulled way back as opposed to zooming in on mine. <laughs> my garden behind my house is about uh, seventy five by seventy five feet, so twenty five meters on either side, so it's not real big. So let's talk about some HF activity challenges. And really, the number one challenge to HF activity for a lot of people is going to be antennas, antennas, antennas. They are big. Uh, a lot of people other than ham see them as very ugly and imposing structures, and they don't want them near them. So in the US, we have something called uh, homeowner associations, which set rules in a lot of the developments. Now, this isn't everywhere, but in a lot of places, there are homeowner associations and they can dictate things like the color of your mailbox or how, you know, what kind of driveway you have. And you can guess that they are also very strict on antennas. Now, my understanding is you also have uh, two, two different types of uh, ownership. They're called a leasehold and a common hold. Both of those, and I'm not sure the details of them. Uh, I love the quaint names though. And local zoning laws basically come down to telling you no outside antennas allowed in a lot of cases, or they put very strict limitations on it. You know, it can only be six foot high or some other ridiculous limitation. Now, the other problem is sometimes that your garden is just too small to fit antennas. You know, you have, it isn't a matter of someone telling you you can't put antennas there, but there's just not a lot of space. And then, of course, if you're in a high rise, an apartment building, a multi-unit housing, sometimes there's just no place outside of your immediate dwelling to put up an antenna. So that can be a big uh, pro problem. So some of the possible antenna solutions, temporary antennas, those are ones that you can put up, have them up while you're operating and take them down before the, the whatever authority complains about it. Uh, you can also take temporary antennas and use them at portable locations away from your shack, uh, operating parks on the air, summits on the air, other activities. Sometimes stealth and hidden antennas work very well. We have a variety of stealth and hidden antennas that we use in the UK, including those that are in attics, but those that are also designed as flagpoles, uh, bird feeders, trellises, etc. cetera, uh, that people don't seem to mind a 30 foot flagpole in your front yard, but they have a fit if there's a 30 foot antenna in your front yard. Also, if you're up on a high rise, uh, indoor antennas or balcony antennas are a possibility. Uh, depending on the structure of the the construction of the structure, uh, indoor antennas may or may not be effective. Sometimes the structure just has so much metal in it that it's basically a Faraday cage, and it's not going to let any RF in or out. Sometimes simply putting that temporary antenna in front of the window can make a huge difference. And even with attic antennas, some of the new roofing materials used have insulating property. I mean, sorry, uh, metal in the materials so that they act as a Faraday cage also. Mobile or portable operations is another thing. And then if everything else fails, having a remote operating shack, in other words, a shack that is not where you're at, uh, that you can access. And this is common by becoming more and more common as the ability to use the internet to link between these is possible. The second challenge is limited opportunities. And this may occur with the foundation license where people don't feel like they have enough power to operate. And if that's the case, you need to tune in on uh, next Monday night for the RSGB at eight. I'm doing a presentation on QRP, but uh, we'll save that talk for a little bit later. Some people are also able to unable to use all of the allocations because they might not know how to use CW and that would limit them from using the CW portion of the band. Now there's a way around that. You can learn Morse code. And then sometimes the problem is too many people on the band and sometimes it's not enough people on the band. So you want something just in between enough people, but not too many people to work. So um, the way around these mode and frequency things is sometimes to, and this is for us to, to, to upgrade uh, learning Morse code. Uh, trying out antennas for bands that you've never tried before. A lot of times I hear from people that say, you know, I only operate 40 and 20 meters and they're always so crowded. And I ask them here, have you ever tried 17 meters or have you ever tried some of the other bands? And they said, no, I don't have an antenna for that. 
So having an antenna for additional bands or finding out if you can tune your existing antennas on some of these bands can really uh, enrich your operating cap uh, possibilities. Trying out FT8 and FT4 works very well with limited antennas because of the their ability to work in a low signal to a noise ratio situation. So sometimes trying out a different mode might be the way around some of these problems. So those are some of the challenges that are out there with antennas. And I forgot to mention, I'm just gonna go back real quick to this one slide here. This particular slide has uh, a number of antennas that can be used either stealth, hidden, or uh, temporarily. And this is actually put by together by an HOA amateur radio, a group that work, lives in an HOA in Florida. It's called the Villages. Uh, TVARC is the, the Villages Amateur Radio Club. And they have like 120,000 people. It's basically a retirement village. And there's a lot of HOA laws there. So they actually put together a whole little chart on how on how good various antennas were on different bands, different modes, and how good they were on the air, how stealth they were to hide, uh, whether they needed a tuner or not, uh, how difficult installation was, cost, and then effectiveness on each of the different bands. And this is just their little chart. So if you have limitations, there are ways to get around it. So what we're going to do now is shift gears a little bit and talk about something that was not even on anyone's radar pre-1980 in amateur radio, but became very much part of the hobby uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and that is computers in the Radio Shack. There's a lot of uses for computers in a Radio Shack. You can control your radio from the computer. You can operate digital modes like FT8 and FT4, which require a computer to do the encoding and decoding. You can use it to keep your log. Uh, contesters were one of the first people to start using uh, computer software because they wanted fast, efficient ways of logging contacts. It could be helpful in doing QSLing, both paper QSLing, filling out information and keeping track of it, but also doing electronic QSLing. And I have a whole presentation on that available on electronic QSLing. You can also use a computer to help find stations to work uh, using spotting clusters or the reverse beacon network, even checking your own signal via the reverse beacon network. It can also be used as a secondary band scope display. A lot of radios have band scopes on them nowadays, but you can also have an external band scope display on a computer, and that really is when a second and third monitor becomes handy. So the idea of having a computer in the shack really benefits if you can interface it with the radio. That means that you have two-way communication between the radio and the computer. Uh, Computer-assisted uh, uh, transceiver control, CAT control, which I'll talk about in a few seconds. But computers can also be used for um, periodic tasks, such as programming a radio using a, a computer. This is especially uh, helpful on VHF, UHF radios. Um, it can also be used as a point to bring audio in and out from the radio. And this is necessary, of course, with the sound card mode, such as FT8, WinLink, etc. And I'll talk, I'll give you a little diagram of that in a few seconds here. You can also use it for uh, bringing in audio for other purposes. Uh, you can use it to do virtual audio with a sound card, but you can also use it with programs like N1MM. When you're doing a phone contest, you can actually run macros that'll send uh, a recording from your computer out through your microphone. Computers can also be used to uh, control tuners, rotators, uh, amplifiers, etc. As far as CAT interfacing goes, uh, this type of radio connection, most earlier rigs used uh, RS-232 or a proprietary type of configuration. Most newer radios use USB cables. Uh, if you're still using a radio with RS-232 and you don't have an RS-232 port on your computer, you can buy a USB to standard RS-232 interface cable. Uh, just make sure when you're doing that, you get a high quality cable. I would suggest you get one with an FTDI interface chip in it. Avoid the prolifics because of some, not necessarily problems with the prolific chip itself, but problems with counterfeits and software issues with prolific drivers. Now, the nice thing is if you have a newer radio, you might be, so we'd be, be able to go out and buy a standard USB AB cable and be all set. I suggest the ones with the ferrite suppressors on them. As I mentioned earlier, CAT stands for Computer Aided Transceiver. 
CAD allows you to control the frequency and mode of your rig using a computer program, whether it's a logging program, cost testing program, etc. It also allows you to, to read the frequency and mode from the rig and import it into a computer program, such as your logging program. Earlier CAT interfaces used RS-232 or TTL, transistor, transistor logic. If TTL was used, a level converter was using necessary. So if you have an older rig that has TTL, you'll need some sort of uh, TTL to RS-232 interface even before you get to the USB. And some system, early systems used proprietary interfaces and or connectors, or they required you to install a special board in a radio. So even though you might think a particular radio You've seen it with computer control, it might not come that way from the factory. And in older radios, it's very hard to find those modules. So if you're looking, for example, at an old Kenwood 6, TS680, you had to install a separate module for computer control. So if you buy a used radio and it doesn't have it in there, good luck on trying to interface that. So one of the big things is the CAT control, but the second one is the sound card interfacing. And if you have a radio that has a sound card built into it, it's usually a matter of one simple USB cable to do both the CAT and the audio interfacing for the sound card. If your radio does not have a sound card, you need a separate CAT interface and a separate sound card interface. And I have a whole presentation on FT8 and FT4 that grows into this in great detail. The sound card interface is used to share computer and radio audio streams. We talk about them as being sound card modes, but really the sound card is actually the least significant piece in the puzzle because all the sound card is doing is transferring the sound from the computer to the radio and back and forth. It's the computer programs that are doing all the heavy lifting where they're encoding and decoding the various modes and then sending that audio stream out via the sound card to the radio. Many sound card interfaces also have push to talk control so that they can uh, key the radio. And as I said earlier, this is built into many newer radios. If you do need to buy a sound card interface, there's a number of them out there from different uh, companies. You hear a lot about the signal link, but there are other ones you might want to consider. I like the DigiRigs because they're rather inexpensive and they're just a little about two and a half inches long. They're really tiny little things, but there's a whole bunch of them out there. And these are all links to more information on any of these particular uh, devices right in here. This is the DigiRig Mobile. And you can click on any of these links to get more information. Also, I have a slideshow on FT8 and FT4. Also, have a slideshow on WinLink. WinLink is used quite a bit in emergency communications, and it's a sound card based mode that uses some additional software, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then also more information on other digital sound card modes, such as PSK. Even tradi more traditional modes like RIDI can be done via sound card interfaces. So, what I did is this is part of my, new my article that will be in the March issue of CQ Magazine. I have an article called Preparing Your Radio to Use Digital Sound Card Modes. And this is the diagram from that article that will be in the magazine. Basically, you want to get your radio capable of sound card compatibility, and then connect it to your computer, whether it's a radio that already has a sound card built in or whether you're going to add an external radio so uh, sound card interface. Then you interface that to your computer. After you do that, you can have two basic groups of programs. Now, the group on the left requires you to install nothing more other than the specific programs to run the software you want to run. So installing something like WSJTX will give you access to FT8, FT4, and these other modes. Installing a piece of software like FL Digi will give you access to all of these sound card modes, plus some traditional modes that aren't thought as sound card modes, such as RIDI, and even uh, decoding CW to, to some extent. So this these are both free programs. Once you get your radio ready to go and simply installing one of these two programs can allow you to really increase the possibilities of operating. Now, on the right here, we have some special software. It's basically a software based modem. This is from a uh, an EA ham. Uh, his software uh, is called Vara. And once you install Vara, you can then install a number of other programs to run WinLink. Uh, VAR AC, VAR FM, VAR chat, VAR images. And these are used quite a bit in emergency communications. They're becoming more and more useful over time. And what this basically this modem does is it replaces the 
commercial hardware Pactor modems that were very popular for doing email via amateur radio for people on boats. And they cost thousands, they cost hundreds of hundreds and even thousands of dollars. And not only after you bought the box that it cost money, but you had to buy licensing for different modes that you wanted to use. So this is a about a $60 program that you can register through him. And it does away with, you know, a couple, a couple hundred or thousand dollars worth of cost. The other thing I want to talk about with computers is logging software. And I have a whole presentation on logging software. If you're not keeping a log, I really suggest you do. I know in the US in 1980, 80 something, the uh, FCC decided we no longer need to keep a log, but I keep a log and I have all my contacts logged. I even transfer my paper logs to my computer log. And I have about 113 QSOs logged in my logbook from both my station and from a special event station that I run periodically. So I, there's a slideshow and a link with a video on that information. And I think, let's see, I think, oh, I got one more. Got one also, more. I have a presentation I did for the Rat Pack group on amateur radio and computers that goes into more depth than the, the last, I covered in the last eight slides, including things like operating your laptop on field power, let's say you're doing field day or you're doing a POTA operation and you want to use your laptop, how do you operate it in the field for extended periods of time? Okay, Dennis. Okay, back over to me. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about some of this, this next part last time, but we're going to just emphasize that again. You're going to have to have other bits and bits and bobs to put your station together. Things like coaxial cable accessories, jumpers, short, a short jumper to connect something together, like your radio to an antenna tuner or a SWR power meter, or even what I held up a little while ago, my little, uh, my little uh, uh, surge suppressor for the receiver. I have to have a little coax jumper to connect that up to the radio. Uh, you might have a B, a, what we call AB switches. I, I can't tell if you can see that in there. You can't see the rack here next to that. I've got a rack full of antenna switches here next to me. Those are other things that are really common. If you have multiple antennas or multiple radios, you need a way to be able to switch between them. The other thing that is really useful are adapters because you'll find that, well, this radio's got a type N connector and my cable's a UHF connector. How do I put those together? Well, I get a UHF to N adapter and I can take care of that. So some of the common connectors, UHF, BNC, SMA for things like if you're using some of the little uh, the little do uh, uh, SDR dongle type receivers, they'll have an SMA connector. So you'll need adapters to be able to move back around. Uh, we talk about barrel connectors. Barrel connectors are useful if you want to uh, connect uh, two common connectors together, like two BNC connectors or two UHF connectors. Um, you'll you'll use a barrel connector. Um, they're available for whatever kind of connectors you're. Uh, you're going to be using. And of course, I mentioned the AB switch or even multiple positions. Some of these switches here, I've got some six position switches. I've got some four position switches to be able to move things around. Those are all useful accessories as you, as you grow your station. The other thing is tools. It's another item for installation and maintenance. Um, a very useful item to have in your radio shack is a soldering iron. Uh, I, I can't imagine being without a soldering iron these days. <laughs> it's, it just it, it just it just escapes me. But having solder and possibly liquid flux to make things uh, solder ease more easily sometimes, uh, things like that are very uh, very useful. Um, a wire stripper, uh, uh, another useful. So you know you can use a pocket knife, you can use a pair of diagonal cutters to strip wire. But boy, having a proper wire stripper just makes the job so much easier. Uh, pliers, uh, you know, just regular gas pliers, uh, needle nose pliers, side cutters, all of these things are useful tools to have. Um, if you're using crimp type connectors, uh, you, it, many of them require a special tool. So you have to have a special crimp tool with special dies on them for crimping those connectors. Uh, so that's another investment in another tool. And I, I use a lot of that here in my Radio Shack uh, uh, crimp type connectors. Both uh, N-type, UHF, and BNC connectors are all crimp connectors that I have. Uh, different types of tape, uh, electrical tape, waterproofing tape. The one that I really like is one that's made by 3M. It's referred to as a self-vulcanizing tape. Uh, essentially, in terms of waterproofing, 
once it's on, it, it keeps everything out. And basically you stretch it and it changes the chemical composition of the tape. And as you wrap it, it, it bonds to itself quite strongly. And you, you basically, the only way to remove it is to cut it off with a knife. Uh, so that's a that's something to look for is a for for a waterproofing and then of course screwdrivers all different types of drivers including all types of little bits because some things use you know somebody uses a Phillips screw here somebody uses a slot screw here but this guy over here uses a Torx screw so having all those different types of uh, of, of screwdriver bits is very useful. Go ahead. And we have a whole uh, Rad Pack presentation you might want to watch on holiday gifts for amateur radio. We talk a lot in there about different types of tools. We also have another very interesting presentation on uh, a MacGyver style uh, use of different things in the field when you don't have the tools that you need to have or things you might want to bring along with you. So there's very interesting presentations from the Rad Pack group, and we'll give the link to those at the very end here. That's a great presentation too. The, both of those actually. Uh, test equipment, uh, and you don't have to make a huge investment in test equipment, but there's some basic pieces of test equipment. Having a multimeter or a voltometer, a VOM, is is useful so that you can measure voltage and resistance. Uh, you can do testing for continuity or open circuits with those, um, and measure polar. You can check polarity on a power source. See where's my power, where's my positive lead versus the negative lead. Um, so those are real inexpensive, simple tools to have on hand. Uh, different types of measuring devices like calipers and wire gauges are also useful. I have. Uh, I have two different types of calipers. As you show here, I've got a set of calipers with a digital dial on it. I've got one with a little rotary dial, a little micrometer on it. And I use those all the time. They're quite useful to have around the ham shack. So anyway, um, so moving on from tools, mentoring. And, and mentoring is probably one of the, to me, one of the most important aspects of amateur radio. And as a community, it's it's really incumbent upon us to mentor the newcomers. I mean, that's that's why Anthony and I are doing this presentation. This is all about mentoring. Um, I had many mentors when I was a youngster, when I was a kid getting into amateur radio and getting started. And I see mentoring for myself as a way to give back to the community for those people that gave to me when I was much younger and, and just learning. So mentors are there to help you answer questions and avoid a lot of pitfalls. And there certainly are plenty of pitfalls that you could fall into, unfortunately, but they can, they can, they can, you can talk with them about what type of rig to buy. Uh, they can loan you tools such as an antenna analyzer is a useful tool for, for getting your antenna working correctly. Uh, you may be, you may want to have that on hand. It's something you can invest in. They are very inexpensive these days, but if you don't want to do that, find someone who can loan you one. Uh, or if you're having trouble understanding a particular concept, having a mentor is a good way to get through that. Um, and if you haven't already, we suggest you find mentor or mentors. Multiple mentors are not a bad thing. You may have one mentor that is his, his or her specialty is antennas, and another one may be uh, digital modes, for instance. So uh, don't, don't think that you just have to have one mentor. I consider myself having as a kid, having five different mentors as I was growing up in amateur radio. And I've still got a few today, even though I've been at this for 50 plus years, I have a couple of mentors that I rely on very heavily these days still. So uh, it's it's an important aspect of amateur radio. So how do you find a mentor? That's a, a question that you might ask. And and first place to look, of course, are the clubs. And and you belong to a club here. And I'm sure you have a, a process there within, within the club to, uh, to have mentoring. Uh, but if you just joined or you you just got that license, um, there's lots of old timers around that are that are more than happy to help newcomers. And a lot of I don't know if your club does, but a lot of clubs do have formal mentoring programs. So that's something uh, important to uh, look into. Uh, of course, we're talking to an amateur radio club here, so this is as much a problem. But but for New Ham's finding an amateur radio club uh, in the UK, the RSGB Club Finder, we have something similar to that here in the United States with the ARRL. But that link will take you to the Club Finder at the RSGB website, and you can use that to find uh, local local ham clubs around where you live. Uh, the other thing I I would make use of is things like QRZ.com. QRZ.com gives you the ability to look at other hams, see who lives around you. Who are your neighbors? Who are your ham neighbors that you might want to contact if you've never spoken with them? So that's another way to, to find uh, 
folks who are willing to mentor. And actually, so. on my on the links I'll give you at the end here, I have a link that basically says find hams in your area. It gives you a couple different ways ah, to find hams yeah. in your area, how to yeah. use the QRZ tools to find them. So I'll bring that up at the end here. Yeah, that's a that's a great tool. So a few years back, um, my nephew got his license. He was, I think he was 20 at the time, maybe. And uh, I started writing him emails and notes. And then I created a Google document that I used so I could keep track of the things I was sending to him. And someone saw that at one time and said, that's a really good thing for a new ham. So I put together the original notes I had plus some other things. And I call it the quick ham radio quick start guide. And when you click on that link, of course, this is designed for the U.S., so there's going to be some differences. But I start even before someone gets their license talking about if you're interested in amateur radio, how the licensing structure is set up, what's on the licensing test, licensing exams, getting ready for the test. Uh, after, then the important part starts with after you pass the exam. What are the kind of things you want to do, like joining a local radio club, downloading a band chart of uh, frequency allocations for your license, uh, finding a, a mentor or Elmer in your area, joining your national organization, putting together your station, um, learning best practices, uh, blogs and YouTube channels that are good for uh, amateur radio, expanding your radio activity with different uh, operating modes, frequencies, etc. And then information on free software and paid shareware that you might find helpful, general things, more specific things. Also, different websites with contact activities, major rig manufacturers, vendors, etc. So this is just something I put together, and you're welcome to use it as a as a, a starting point if you'd like to put something together that would be more uh, suited to UK hams. But that's the uh, little quick start guide. Another thing to do is if you're interested in getting started on HF, like we've been talking about for the last three sessions is to work with someone else do it as a group project and what our local club did was we had a lot of people that weren't operating hf they had the privileges but they just weren't doing it so we thought we need to do something and what we did is we started something called the band expiration net this meets after our vhf uhf net on mondays and each week of the month we rotate to a different band we do six meters and 10 meters first these are both available to technicians in the u.s so we wanted to keep those so we would be able to include everyone in the club. The third week we move on to 40 meters. The fourth week of the month we move to 80. When there is a fifth week, which is about two or three times a year, we go to a, an alternative band. During the winter time we do 160, and during the summer we do 12 or 17. And for a special event this year, yesterday, or no, Monday night, the 30th of January, was our fifth Monday of the month. So we did 160, but we also did on AM. So we had a 160 AM night, which was very interesting. And the whole idea is to get people on the radio. And a lot of people say, well, I don't have an 160 antenna. Well, let's try something out, see what you can tune up at your house or put something up, or I don't have a six meter antenna. So the idea was those that with needed radio and antennas to transmit on the selected uh, band can directly participate. We suggested others who were unable to transmit the least try listening to us, whether it was through a suboptimal antenna or using an on-air software-defined radio if they didn't even have an HF radio. We encouraged new members to try new bands, put up additional antennas, and to experiment with propagation. We found out how hard it is to do a net on 40 meters when we're all within a small area. When 40 meters becomes too long, it becomes very, very difficult. Six and 160 are work much better than 40 does typically. Some more resources. Uh, people always talk about books. Well, the, the AWRL handbook is a good book to have, but it's not necessarily the book that I suggest the new people just starting out because it's much more technical than operating oriented. So I put, picked out four books that I think have a lot of good information on operating. The first is the uh, Your First HF Station. Uh, it's an AWRL publication, the AWRL Operating Manual, Ham Radio for Dummies. Now, it might sound like it's a, you know, one of those really dumbed down books. Well, it happens to be written by Ward Silver, who's one of the best authors in amateur radio. And there's also a companion web page that goes along with the book. So it's actually a very good book. And then the RSGB uh, Amateur Radio Operating Manual uh, is another good book. If you're looking for videos, these are the three of the people on YouTube that I suggest. There's a lot of people on YouTube, I think, that give... Uh, 
a lot of less than stellar amateur radio information and a lot of people spend a lot of time listening to him because they're entertaining but the information they give is rather shallow and often slanted by promotions that they're getting from various manufacturers of equipment but these three people i think do a very good job if you're looking for operating aids charts and maps traditionally they were all on paper and i have a number of them here that in my link that you can print out but you can also display these on your screen so a lot of things can be printed out with a printer or you can display them on your screen. Now, some of these, of course, will be useless for the UK, but if you want to know what the privileges are in the US, of course, that's helpful to know. And don't worry, I have the UK one at the end, but uh, a number of different band plans, grid maps, uh, CQ zones, uh, different worldwide maps, uh, European map, uh, US districts and states and a list of AWRL sections. So when you click on any of these, it's going to bring you out to more information. Uh, I was disappointed I couldn't find a good Canadian provinces map, so I actually made one myself. And I have that available, and it has not only the provinces, but it also has the prefix for the various provinces. And this is a trivia question many of you may not know. The VE0 prefix is reserved for maritime mobile stations in the UK. So that's the charts and maps. And then there's also some uh, other information here, including software programs like generating an azimuthal maps centered on your location so you know which way to turn your rotor, uh, software to keep track of DX stations you work, et cetera, grid squares. And this is the one that I talked about earlier uh, to find a ham in your area. So if you click on this link that says find a ham, it'll talk about how you can use uh, different sources to find your grid square but then also to find other hams in your area using qrz.com. So that's the charts and maps section, and that's one of the resources that's available in this presentation. Now, we covered everything. This is the end, basically, and you might say, that was a really great session. I'd like to share that with a friend. Well, the way you can do that is I put together one link that is basically an advertisement for the HF series we just did with Denby Dell, with De uh, Dennis and I, and we talk about it, and uh, we also have an introduction to the VHF and UHF that I did with N6VI for the Rat Pack group. So that's four sessions. When you scroll down further, you'll see the links to this session. I will put in the uh, the final YouTube here at the end for um, the upcoming. This is the U.S. version. I got to put. I'll make sure that you have the VK V UK version. I'll make sure this link is fixed because this link is not right right now. So I need to fix that but it it's basically a document you can share with other people so they can get to all this material also if you're where did that come from also if you're interested in qrp on hf i'm going to be doing the presentation next monday for the rsgb at eight live webinars and that's going to be qrp operations and that brings us to our end but before we go to questions just a couple quick things this is the link that I talked about to all my slideshow presentations and all my resources, tiny.cc slash k8zt-p. When you click there, it'll take you out to all of the slideshows I just did. And I've just created two new ones in the last week. I have a new one uh, called 10, meters fun, 10 Meter Band Fun for All. And I just created one last yesterday, actually, uh, using, uh, spreadsheets to, using spreadsheets to analyze log data. This was a request from EL2BG. He saw my spreadsheet that I use, and he was interested. So I put together a presentation. I'm going to be tweaking uh, as we go along. So that is the end, and we will now take questions and answers. And again, to get all the resources from this slideshow, tiny.cc slash UKBGHF. I'll go ahead and stop my screen share. And we'd be happy to try and answer questions. I think we might have a few in the chat. Let me see here. Okay, so uh, thanks, Nick. Put the, put the link in there for my session I'm going to be doing on Monday. And I will put the link in the chat for all my presentations at my website. And I will fix that link in the presentation so you have that document if you want to share it with anyone on all these resources.
radio hams are all odd <laughs> <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter what country you're in dennis and i can contribute to that well maybe i'm even i don't know <laughs> or even odder even odder there you go better still ask my <laughs> wife she'll tell you <laughs> well we'd be happy to try and answer any questions about anything that we covered in all three sessions or anything about amateur radio or anything about us yeah yeah hi anthony um well both of you very very interesting lecture thank you just a um quick one on the console with the collins uh oh, i noticed yeah. one of the earlier slides um cooling of when you start to put stuff in a console like that how do they uh, go on with the cooling of the equipment ah uh, yeah okay so that console th those are specifically designed to specification by collins radio and i'm trying to remember i think that was called the ambassador is what the name of that console was and there, there are shelves in there and there's ability to put fans and things like that in to be able to keep the equipment cooler. And the back of it is open so that the, you get air circulation. Uh, you can enclose the back. In fact, I think the one that Pete had did have an enclosed back of because of where it was located in the room. But yeah, that's a very good point. All that old vacuum tube equipment is a real, they're real heat generators and uh, it helps to have a lot of good cooling. And, and yeah, I've got... Uh, Let's see what I've got there. I've got one tube radio sitting over there and it's all by itself. These guys are all out in the open here in front of me, the old Collins gear. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a big concern because on the older radios, the heat tends to degrade the equipment over time. So if it's been getting hot for pushing 50 years, it's, <laughs> it's going to have problems, but yeah, that's a great, great question. But okay, yeah, thanks. Thank things you. like that are a good way to do that. Yeah. I never had that problem with my two Watts. Yeah, <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> I'll have to add that to my Q, to my QRP lecture for Monday. Another reason is the void overheating. Void overheating, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We know all about heat from radios here. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, Other questions? There you go. Keeps your shack warm in the winter time. Unfortunately, it didn't keep it warm enough. That was the. That was the problem. Our, our HVAC system failed. Uh, we, we had a leak in one of the uh, refrigerant lines, so it stopped working. We couldn't cool or heat. And thankfully, it was it started at the end of summer, so we weren't in the hot weather. But um, uh, <laughs> it was a, a real chore to get this place warmed up uh, on a cold day. And even the tube gear, running the tube gear full tilt, with the amplifiers and everything, it still wasn't enough to heat it up. But uh, in the summertime, it, it it's it's much nicer to run solid state gear in the summertime when it's hot. <laughs> and I ask that. a question. Oh, oh sorry. Right, go ahead, Adrian. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. I'm I'm just yeah, going on. Uh, go ahead. One of the problems I've found, uh, especially in the UK and in recent years, is the high noise levels. Uh, both within the community and general noise levels being high. Do you have any tips for reducing these? Modern radios, a lot of the modern radios have uh, what they, you know, digital signal processing, DSP, and those can be used to, um, to reduce things like uh, 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 interference, the interference type, electrical noise, things like that. Um, and that came out of running mobile, we used to have a lot of problems with ignition noise from your automobile. So we'd have a, what they call an impulse noise uh, blanker. So that's one way to get rid of that type of noise. And electrical noise from the mains tends to be an impulse type noise with arcing over and things like that. The DSP allows you to do things like um, have adjustable filter, bandwidth filters and adjustable skirt shapes and things like that for your filtering, which you can get rid of uh, a man-made or QRM, you know, man-made interference, maybe another station that's right adjacent to you. You can use the filtering to avoid that other station. Um, but yeah, there's, and, and of course, if you've got an older radio that doesn't have that type of fancy stuff, you can use something like this right here. This is something that's no longer manufactured. But JPS made these things years ago. This is a, a DSP-12, 
And I found that this was just such a fantastic piece of equipment for doing noise reduction and getting rid of interference and even getting rid of atmospheric noise. Um, they have a, a mode in here <clears throat> that, uh, let's see, what do they call that? And this thing, I haven't used this one for a long time. I've got it disconnected, but this is a, a JPS was the company. It's an NIR, November India Romeo 12. And they made two models. They made a 10 and a 12. And the desirable one is this 12 because it's a it's got two processors in it. The 10 was not as powerful. And these you can still find these occasionally, like at ham fests, and you can probably find them on QRZ or QRZ on eBay. Uh, yeah, QRZ, you might find them there too. Um, these are great for getting rid of interference uh, and, and what have you. And it's adjustable bandwidth filter and all of that. I highly recommend this box. Now, the uh, second thing is if you can identify where the noise source is, sometimes you can eliminate, eliminate. the noise source. Now, and the first place I would look, and this is the place that you have the most control, is check your own, own house. Yeah. It's funny, the little things that might be causing substantial noise that you wouldn't expect. Uh, touch lamps, LED lamps, uh, controller units. I had a timer for a set of outdoor lighting that was the noisiest thing possible, and it was a very easy fix. Now, sometimes you're going to find out that as you start searching, they're not on your property. Uh, sometimes they're a next door neighbor. I, we have one member of our club who had a next door neighbor who was growing. We'll, we'll call them mini carrots in her basement with light sources. I don't think they were really mini carrots because that's not a real high cash crop. But she had a she had a noise producing light unit. It was it wasn't the lights. It was the transformer, and it took everything out from forty meters to I think he said seventeen meters was completely wiped out. So he actually uh, went over and said if she asked her if she'd like some assistance with her carrot growing, and he helped her find an appropriate transformer to use, and it cut all the noise out. Sometimes it's also utility um, and. Yeah, I don't know how responsive they are to utility problems in the UK, but in the United States, it really depends on where you're at and who you know. But if you can identify it to a specific poll, uh, that gives them a better chance of, of finding out. And we have a number of people. We have a person in our club that has uh, direction finding equipment for noise, and he's a great person to call out. And he'll track it down to the poll and say, there it is. It's that transformer. It's that bad connection. And once you can tell the utilities that, the nice thing in Ohio is if you tell them and you re, you get it documented and they don't do anything about it and you've documented it sufficiently, once you go back the second time, if they don't do anything, you can then proceed to uh, uh, pursue them legally. So, um, you know, finding the area and it's sometimes it's hard to even realize because some of the things are intermittent noise. And that's one of the most difficult ones is picking out something that's causing intermittent noise in your house. I actually went to the point where I shut everything down in my house and I was operating battery powered to see if I could figure out where the noise was coming from when I had one particular noise and it turned out to be in the house. I thought it was not in the house, but when I turned all the power off and I turned it off at the mains coming into the house, there was still noise and I tracked it down to a transformer for an old uh, doorbell wow. that was up in the attic that we weren't even using, but it was still up there heating up and using energy. But um, so yeah, you might want to you know go to battery power sometime and just knock all the mains off, turn the mains back on, then turn on one circuit at a time and see if you can track down. But yeah, tracking down noise is probably one of the best things to do. Or as Dennis said, you know dealing with it at the radio end, especially for things that you have no control over. You you just mentioned the ANC four. That's I was just going to show you. This is another device that I've used, and I have a have a couple of these here. Um, if you have a noise source that you can't get rid of. This actually uses, a, uh, you actually null the noise out. So you use two antennas. You've got your, you connect it up to your main antenna that you're using. And then you have a separate antenna that you might put close to where the noise source is if you've identified the noise source. And then you adjust this to null that noise out. It'll basically just subtract it out of the signal. And these were originally made by JPS. That's JPS developed this product and they sold the product to TimeWave. And TimeWave is another one of the groups that, that makes, uh, makes these uh, noise reduction systems. But, but uh, this is a great little box and somebody uh, who uh, was that, you talked about the MFJ product. Yeah, there, there are a number of products on the market that, uh, that are, can be used. These products are all, this particular one is active in the radio, with the radio and the antenna. So it's actually 
focusing on the RF portion of the interference. The other boxes like the, the MFJ and the JPS that I talked about, those actually process the audio. So they're not, it's not going to be as good as if your radio had uh, DSP in it. And a good example of that uh, on an older radio, like the old ICOM uh, 756 Pro 3, had a very, very good DSP uh, noise uh, reduction system. The modern SDRs, like the flex radios here, have incredible capabilities for getting rid of noise uh, and interference, uh, filters and, and uh, uh, wideband noise reduction, things like that, which are great for getting rid of interference and noise and atmospheric noise, things like that. So. I, I just but, want to mention this yeah. one presentation. This is this is sort of the, going the other way. When you're not sure whether you're getting out or not, whether other people are hearing you, I put together a whole presentation basically on assessing your station, both using uh, hard um, using instruments, but then also using other people to listen, but then also using things like the reverse beacon network, um, beacons, and then using uh, online software-defined radios to listen to your signal from a distance and record it. Uh, so there's a lot of different things you can do to test your signal to see whether uh, it's working and getting out and seeing whether the problem is on your end or just no one likes you and doesn't want to talk to you. <laughs> and in that case, we, you need to work only in contests where you're worth points. So yeah. if you don't have any friends, you need to contest. <laughs> Uh, Lots of guys without <laughs> friends, then. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. Uh, anyone else want to ask a question to Anthony or Dennis? Yeah, Anthony. I wonder, yes. thanks, Dennis and Anthony, by the way. I wonder, have you any tips for the youngsters who may be really nervous about pressing the microphone? I wonder... Have you got a presentation yes. on that? How yes. to overcome the sort of first digit nerves of pressing that microphone for the first time and the getting used to the idea of talking to strangers? Because it's, I remember it's a nervous thing to do the first time you do it if you're a teenager. Oh, yeah. FT8, it's called FT8, FT4. Get them on the digital <laughs> modes first. After they do that for a while, they don't, they're, they're, they've made plenty of contact. So the initial fear is gone. So it's a great way to ease you in. The other way is really, believe it or not, one of the best ways is to get them in a contest because then the amount of material they have to say is already pre-scripted. It's very limited. So they, they don't have that fear that someone's going to ask me a question I don't know. All they're going to ask you for in that contest is your exchange. So you don't have to worry that they're going to ask you, you know, uh, tell me how Ohm's law works or something like that. Because that's, I think, a lot of times a fear. It's not so much just the fear of talking to someone, but it's the fear of what the other person might ask them and they might not know the answer. So mm. I think contesting are a great place to get kids on the air. And they like the competitive nature. Use an online scoreboard so they can see the scores as you rack up the scores. Uh, show, you know, do assisted so they can see the stations coming in through um, the DX cluster, and then they can pick out those particular stations and try and work them. But I think contesting is a great way to get people past mm -hmm. mic fright. You throw them into a really fast water, but you throw them in with confidence that they only need to know a couple things. And thank you. Yeah, good tip. Thank you. You yeah. know, it's sometimes when you walk out into that stream that looks real calm, you're afraid you might sink. But if you're going into that rapid, you know that you got to flow through it. So, yeah, contesting is a great way. I was going to. I always that think that. Go I ahead. always think that contest is such a, um, like say, such a deep end. Yeah, the, 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 everybody knows what they're doing except you. That's what it feels like, you know. Yeah, but if they, if you know, if they know the, you know, in practice it too. Let them, you know, one of the things I've done a lot of times, people say, and this isn't for kids, but I, I get a lot of people that say, you know, I'm interested in contesting, but I just can't use that's the contesting software. It just, I get all frustrated. I said, sit there, tune in a station that's running, and pretend you're logging for them. Then you don't have any pressure on you as far as making contacts and you'll learn the logging software and it'll become second nature. The next time when you do it, when you're talking and you're logging, you'll be comfortable because you've already logged for someone who is moving really fast and working stations quickly and there's no pressure on you. Yeah. 
Mm. Okay, thanks very much. That's another kid kid thing to do too is get them logging for you, and that all of a sudden then, and you know, and then keep asking them occasionally, you know, what was that call sign? So it really gets their ability to, to hear things because that's part of the other trick too. When you get someone on the air for the first time, they may not be comfortable also knowing that they're hearing the other station well. So they're not. They might be say, you know, on single sideband it sounds weird, or I don't know all the jargon, or I don't know all the information. So if you have them logging for a while, that gets them over that mic fright also. You know, I was yeah. going to add to that, that it's not just kids. I mean, it's a, a, yes, a, everyone. Uh, when they first, uh, I, I shouldn't say everyone, but but a lot of new hams and and upgrades and things like that, they, they you, you'll experience that. Uh, you, you don't have to be... Uh, a kid to experience Mike fright and be nervous with all of that. So uh, I think Anthony's made a good point. I think the, the idea of logging is great. That's how I started in ham radio. Uh, before I got my license, I was on field day with a radio club and I was logging 40 meter CW, which was pretty fun for me as a kid, <laughs> you know, helping them out. It was a lot easier in those days because uh, we only had to deal with a couple of prefixes. You know, we had, we had W and WA and WB we had, uh, uh, I think we had K, we didn't have the N prefixes yet. And they were all, you know, just simple. There wasn't the, the, the myriad of call signs that we've got in the United States now. So you could use one of the, uh, the paper dupe sheets, the duplicate sheets. It was real easy to use and keep track of what you work. Nowadays, that's the other thing that the, uh, the computer logging software is good for is, is preventing duplicates. And I, that's, I love that. The dupe sheets today are way too complicated. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, guys. Cheers. You're welcome. Other questions? A couple, couple of great resources that were just put up here in the in the chat. Uh, West Mountain Radio. You, somebody, uh, Ken, posted that about West Mountain Radio. They, they they've got some products like we've been discussing, and the one before that. Um, I've not heard of this before, BHI Limited. I just pulled up their website. They got some neat stuff. So I'm going to investigate that a little bit more. Thank you for that link. I'm going to check that out. And that was from uh, Keith. And Jeff put up Wemo. God, I'm not another company I'm not familiar with. Aha. Cool. I, I have a question for part of one of the audience members real quick. Terry, W3NPS, how did you find us or do you always attend the Denby Dell meetings? Well, uh, Anthony, uh, this is not my first time with Denby Dale. Hey, and, and um, I'm proud to be a member of this club for the last couple of years. I discovered them uh, doing these sessions uh, at the beginning of COVID and uh, I haven't been around for a while, but I'm glad to be back. Very good. Outstanding. That's great. Yeah, well, good, uh, good, good to see you, I Terry. Mean... Good to see, good to see you again, Terry. And um, uh, for Anthony and Dennis, when when COVID started, and we started putting our meetings online, uh, we we got all kinds of people. So uh, some of the people in the room here today from other countries are people that have joined the club because they've enjoyed what we've been doing and are part of our family, which is fantastic. Isn't that wonderful? I, that's just that's just fantastic. I, I, Zoom has been such an asset to our community. Yeah, this is just amazing to think that Anthony and I are sitting here thousands of miles away from mm. most everybody there, and and we're doing a presentation uh, unheard of just a short time ago. So and, this and Dennis, has really changed it. Dennis and I have never met in person. We we do all these projects together, and we've never met in person. And nope. the same thing, we have, we're part of that Rat Pack group, and we have uh, every Wednesday and Thursday night. I'm, Wednesday and Thursday night we have a presentation, but every Tuesday night we have a committee member meeting, and with about a half a dozen of us in the committee, and none of us I don't think have ever met each other. Oh, well, you, you've met a, you've met one or two I've, people. Oh, Michelle and yeah. and Marty. Yeah, I've yeah. I've known them for years. Yeah. But it's it's funny we've been operating together, and, th and that we we yes. definitely welcome you to attend those. I know they're a little late because they're at uh, zero two Z, uh, UTC, so they're yes. at uh, two UTC, uh, so a little bit late for you guys. But if you want right. to hang around, the nice thing is we record them all. So if you go to ratpack.us, I'll just go there real quick for you. Yeah, that's we have had. Uh, uh, 
oh, a null steerer. That's kind of what the ANC4 does. Um, that's the idea. Null yeah, steerer. Just so. from yeah. Yeah. Um, the chap in Leeds gave, gave the design of the PCB back in the 70s. And it was, I was teaching in a city centre school with all sorts of electrical noise around. And yeah. you had a ferrite rod aerial, which you bit pointed at the noise. Uh -huh. And then you altered the phase with one control and again with another to cancel out the noise. That's exactly what this does. If you can see ah, the controls okay. under, there's a phase and a gain control, and there's two antennas. So I will comment along that line. There's a really interesting presentation on um, on Rat Pack that Anthony's showing you there on the screen that was called uh, Diversity Reception with Modern Receivers. And one of the things that our speaker spoke about, and he's from Canada, he's a VE, uh, Canadian amateur, and he talks about some of the modern radios that have dual receivers that are um, basically in sync. They've got a common clock on the synthesizer. So if they're both tuned to the same frequency, they're absolutely in phase coherent. But what you can do is you can add software that allows you to um, adjust the phase and amplitude of the output of one of the receivers to accomplish the same thing. Unfortunately, not a lot of receivers. And I was very, very disappointed. The Flex. 6700 doesn't let me do that but i have two flex 5000s which were their older model that had dual receivers that i can do that with and so i can actually use that software with those receivers to change the phase and and amplitude of an interfering signal and null it out with that radio and actually do a proper diversity type reception so interesting interesting stuff and that's that's a great one uh i wasn't aware of that but that's exactly what we're talking about is a null steer that's that's exactly what it would be so that's cool thank you and uh the rat pack it is at ratpack.us and yeah. we record all the sessions so there's over 250 recordings out there uh, Wednesday nights typically are general information, and Tuesday Thursdays are generally emergency communications. And we are ha we happy to have you, uh, you know, in person. But you're always welcome to go watch the YouTube video. So if you want to watch the YouTube video of that diversity reception one, you know, you could just go to that and click on the link and get all the information from uh, Mr. Follows. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I think I in I'm in my next club newsletter. I need to. Uh, send all the links out again with that so people can uh, go and find them. Mm -hmm. Of course, you got to put up with the ads. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, there's the diversity reception. Yeah, that's it. That was fascinating. I, I met him on um, on the QSO Today uh, Ham Radio Expo and asked him to come and join us on Rat Pack, and he was delighted to come and do this presentation. I, I, this was one of the best presentations I've seen on, on doing diversity. So I really, really, I was really, really happy to have him come and join us. So it was really cool. It's a great presentation. Well, brilliant. Well, before we say good night to Anthony and Dennis, um, anyone else got a, a comment or question they want to put? Um, I, I, just uh, just uh, two two very quick things. One is just a, a word of warning to one or two of our our newcomers. The RSGB do publish some very good information on their website about the issue that uh, you were raising, Dennis, about some um, earth bonding. Uh, oh yeah. Because we we do have a although we follow as you know seven six seven one we we uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, we we have a protective a protective multiple earthing system in this country and um uh it, that does mean we do have to be slightly careful if you then decide you want to introduce a new earth in your in your uh -huh. shack you can cause some problems so the rsgb have produced some very good little um uh, new sheets and updates on that uh just to advise people to it's just to just to be cautious i mean the biggest problem i think and you you both of you will probably agree with this uh, the biggest problem we face in the shack is not the electrical safety of the of the systems themselves, because they're all the all the bits and pieces are all I've all got earthing on them that plug into your mains earthing in your house. The big problem we suffer from is common mode current coming back our RF right. cables. 
and right. causing all kinds of problems in our house or neighboring houses and that's yeah. that that's a different issue altogether for us to to cope with but that's that's that i think is the most common problem particularly for those of us um that you know live in properties very close to other people uh that that is a, that is something we have to pay a lot of attention to i would add one thing to that if you're running vintage gear you're not necessarily uh, uh, protected by the equipment and the, the earthing yeah. of the equipment because many, many of the older, older radios didn't have proper uh, proper earthing. If and, and if you look at some of the uh, some of the radios that I have here, uh, they're designed with with the U.S. in mind. Where you and I think you still have the same system where you have a uh, 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 a hot wire, a neutral wire, and a ground. And I think you use different terminology, if I recall. So your hot wire, the neutral wire, and the ground. The, the neutral and the ground are bonded together at the service entrance. Hmm. But some radios have one of those leads tied to the chassis. One of those. That, like, S38. Yeah. So I got that's the first time I got shocked. Yeah, you plug it in <laughs> backwards, and and you have two radio. I, I remember this as a kid with some of the radios I had that hmm. that. Uh, you have two radios sitting next to each other. And if you're touching one and you touch the other one, you can get zapped. And it's only 115 volts here in the States. You're talking about 250 volts mains there. So that's a little bit more substantial. It would be a lot more painful, uh, if not fatal, if you had something like that happen. So you have to be careful, especially with the older gear. That's that's something that I, I have to stay in tune with, with a lot of the stuff I have here. Some radios don't even have a power transformer to isolate them. They're line operated sets. I think I'm yeah. going to add that to my QRP talk also. Not getting zapped. <laughs> not getting zapped. <laughs> not, it's not a good idea. <laughs> not a good, no. I had a similar effect here. I got the next door's house and I didn't realize it was on a different phase of the three uh, thing. And uh, I was trying to pull the aerial from a television in this side into the one at the other side. There was a huge spark and a bang as I oh, tried to put the television in early. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. As long as you didn't get hurt. But uh, <laughs> oh, oh, surprised. <laughs> just surprised. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the one part of HF we didn't talk really a lot about, and I'm not sure how much it's available there, but is the 2220 um, megahertz and the 670 band, those two ultra low frequencies. Oh, the um, meters. Yeah, a lot of people in the U.S. One of the one of the jokes is that that it's it's have you had your fire yet from your from your antenna? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that was the VLF allocations. We have two VLF bands. I'm not sure if the U.K. has a VLF band or yeah, not. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. We we've got two VLF bands. As well, yeah. So it's probably 2,200 and 630 meters. Is it the same yeah. as it is? Here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's where we all, you know, that's where it all started uh, 100 some years ago. It was down in those frequencies. So interesting stuff. Yeah, we did have a talk from a, a Scottish radio amateur on uh, operating VLF, but he did have the advantage of uh, being able to put up a, an aerial that was about half a mile long. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> few, very few would. Um, <laughs> But, but you, it's something you have to get around, and you know, there's ways to do it. Yeah, and it's like setting something on fire. I, Anthony, I'm I am a member of that club. I've I'm never set anything fire, fire yet. I set a tree on fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, it had an antenna that was terminated in a tree, and it arced to the tree branch and set the tree on fire. And I was in I was a kid. I was in high school. And you know, my parents were gone at the time, and I'm, my mom comes home, and I'm going, my mom's going to kill me as I set the tree up. <laughs> I, I could add that to my presentation, too. Few yeah, tree QRP, fires. Yeah, QRP, you're not going to have tree fires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, you I gave me a whole bunch of new things for my pre presentation, Dennis, today. <laughs> or or, no, or, well, uh, or ca ca catching, catching birds in your aerial wire. I got, woke, I got woken up at four o'clock in the morning with a seagull that got caught in my 40 meter loop wire in the back garden. Uh, it was flying, it saw my neighbor's pond and uh, they've got lots of koi carp in it. And this bird was flying down to it, hit the wire, got tangled in it and was making a racket at four o'clock in the morning, uh, completely tied up in my piece of wire. Uh, luckily I was able to very quickly 
uh, drop the wire down and uh, I had to stick a towel over it to stop it biting me, yeah. uh, untang untangled the wire from it and it stood there and just flew away. So completely unharmed, I'm pleased to say. But uh, so, yeah, you can you can catch things with your aerials. We, I had a friend catch a deer by the horns in his uh, in his <laughs> beverage. Six foot is not high enough for a beverage in Ohio. You must have them at at least eight feet or you will get deer in them. I, and, I have it, a friend that has the same problem out here in Arizona. Uh, beverage antenna was constantly being intercepted by deer running through the uh, through the uh, adjacent uh, property. Yep, common problem. Have a well, I think I think we're all looking at each other in our own places and thinking yeah. we haven't got much choice of deer running in our back gardens. <laughs> <laughs> Never know, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I don't have no, any. No, deer you don't know, do you, Gerald? That's true. Well, in well, New no, England, I... in New England, you get the bears, don't you? Yeah. When we I was there, have, we actually have bears here where I live. Believe it or not, they come really? down out of the mountains into the desert, and we've had two instances. Uh, well, actually, one of our my friends who just lives about a mile up the road had a deer trying to break into their home a few years ago, mm -hmm. and another one a couple of years back was caught running through the town of Ridgecrest, which is about oh maybe five miles east a what farther away from the mountains but it had made its way from the mountains which are to the west of me all the way into town and was being chased through some open fields out in the town of ridgecrest a bear you know it's like my goodness where did that come from but yeah i i i don't want a bear knocking at my door here but they are they are in the area so we have to be aware of that we also have cougars you know pumas cougars the big cats uh We've seen them around here at times too so yeah they're out there Dennis yeah. has, a, has the best and worst of all conditions there he, he lives in the desert so he gets really hot weather but then he gets really cold weather then you get mountains next to him and earthquakes and bears high winds and high winds high winds large uh, pre large uh predators <laughs> yeah large predators we have rabbits we got those two we got rabbits we have coyotes we have quail you know we have road runners that's all we, fun stuff i think we have moles moles yes <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> anyway look actually dennis Hi. can i thank you very much indeed it's been a well, really good evening again and uh, uh thank, thank you everybody yeah this has been absolutely wonderful and uh i really enjoyed this thank you for inviting us i've personally uh, really enjoyed this opportunity and and enjoyed meeting everyone and and uh, hopefully uh, sometime in the future we can do this again would be a, would be a lot of fun very much so and I, I think I, Anthony you made the point earlier about um, you know meeting people but never actually having met them in person and you know we do we do that in amateur radio all the time we've, all the time yeah. we've, we've probably all got people we've spoken to on the radio several mm -hmm. times and you you kind of know them to a degree um and zoom has made it even we've become even closer because mm -hmm. of that and uh i i think it's it's it has been uh great for the hobby that we can do this and you know continents and countries and everything aren't a barrier to us uh, the the only wonderful thing of course is uh for adriana and mike and and jeff from uh Germany and Belgium because they speak such good English we don't have Excellent. the uh, we don't have language as a barrier but uh, um, it, it, um, it is fantastic that um, we're able to communicate in this way and share the common pleasure that we all have in amateur radio uh, Absolutely. That's, that's what that's what's come out of your your presentation over the last uh, three weeks that you've been giving it to us is how much both of you and I and I can see, and everyone else can see, you've got different approaches to the hobby and different things you're interested in, but how much pleasure you get from playing with all this stuff, and oh, yeah. and that's that's what that's what we're all sharing, isn't it? It uh, absolutely different is. aspects of yeah. it. It's been a lifetime of pleasure. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Pleasure radio, you know, it really is indeed. I, you know, I'll share one other other item is that um, some years back I I co-authored a book on Arduinos. My co-author lives in Indiana. I live in California. We have never met. We have never met in person. We had never spoken on the telephone. 
but we wrote a book just using um, the internet to be able to send things back and forth via email. And uh, that's a, it's Arduino, Arduino projects for amateur radio. And uh, we just had a blast doing that. And it wasn't until the end that we ever even spoke with each other. And it was our editor with McGraw Hill that got us together on a conference call to talk. <laughs> We were getting close to the end of the project. And then uh, some years later, just more recently, I invited Jack, my co-author, to come and speak on Rat Pack. So that's the first time I've ever seen him uh, live, but we have never, ever met. And and that was back in like 2013, 2012 that we did that. So oh, see, I've actually met Jack because I've, yeah, seen, I've met him a number of times. Yes, at the, the four days, four days in May, I'm sure. Yeah, some other yeah. events in Dayton. Yeah, Dayton. So I've never, I've never met Jack, and and yeah. So you've met him, and I've never met him. <laughs> what we do. So by the way, about... if 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 you ever, if you any of you ever do get over to the states and get a chance to attend uh, the Hamvention in uh, Dayton slash Xenia, Ohio, I'm there almost every year. So uh, I'm in the flea market, and uh, if you're there, stop and say hi. And uh, what uh, date is it this year, Anthony? I think it's. I think it's March 20, I'm sorry, May 22nd, if I remember correctly. I don't remember off the top of my head. I got to check. The thing I've been doing is in the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to put together my schedule because since the beginning of the year, I've had about a dozen requests to speak to different groups. I've over, I've done over 325 presentations to different clubs around the, the, the US, UK, Canada, et cetera. So Dayton is coming up on... Uh, uh, Friday, it'll start on Friday, March 19th. I'm sorry, June, Friday, May 19th. I'm May sorry. 19th. There yes. we go. Yeah. I was going to say, Keith and Rachel, I see your post there. Thank you for your support. That's great. I, I love that. And uh, so we've got an interna international following on our on our title. That is very cool. Uh, that was a lot of fun. That was a great, great project for me. Uh, I was just retired, and uh, what a what a wonderful project to embark on writing a book. <laughs> and Jack was just a great co-author. Yeah, I just really had a great time working with him. So, anyway, I hope to meet him someday in person <laughs> and be able to press the flesh, you know, <laughs> shake hands. Oh well, I, I am in Ohio, but I'm on the opposite end of the state from the Hamvention, so yeah. it is a little bit of a trip, but it's only about three and a half hours for me. <laughs> Well, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna finish off this bit of the meeting yeah. by just yet again saying to you two guys, thank oh, you for a great presentation. You. And uh, if if I drop you an email again in the future and get you back to come and do another presentation together or separately, that would be fantastic. So I would th I, thank absolutely. you very much again. Nick, thank you. Thank you to all the club members and, and really appreciate uh, you having us and, and I just had a great time. So seven three everyone, cheers. Bye, and we'll see you all again. We'll work you on HF. Yes, um, that too.